We all have difficulty with our memories at times, don't we? Bill and Fred were talking, and Bill was telling Fred about a great restaurant experience that he had had with his wife on their anniversary. And he said, Fred, it was one of the best steaks I think I've ever eaten in my entire life. It was a wonderful anniversary celebration. What a great restaurant. Best steak ever. And Fred said, well, what's the name of the restaurant? Where did you go? Um... You know those bright red flowers that grow on bushes and, and the stem it has thorns on them? And he said, Rose? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Rose, where's that restaurant we went to to celebrate our anniversary? You know, we all have difficulties with our memories at times, right? Sometimes forgetting things like where you had a great steak, well, that's not that significant. That's not that important. But forgetting who you are and whose you are, now that, those things are important. And it's critical that we remember at all times who we are, because I believe this, if you don't know who you are, you don't know how to behave. The core message of the Bible is this, we were separated from God because of our sin. Jesus came into our world and became one of us. He lived as a human being. He faced everything like we face. And yet, being tempted in every way to sin against God, he was victorious. He never one time sinned. He died as the perfect sacrifice. Now, one of the things that the Bible teaches about Jesus is this. He himself was the temple of God. In fact, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And by that he was referring to his body, John chapter 2 says. He is the high priest of God according to the book of Hebrews. He is the high priest who offered the final sacrifice for our sins, once for all, never to be repeated. The Hebrews, the Israelite system, the Hebrew system, the Jewish system of worship to God was this. When you sinned, when you broke a commandment of God, you would bring an animal to the temple. The priest would cut the throat of the animal, shed the blood, the life was in the blood. The shedding of the blood was necessary to forgive sins. But we understand that an animal is not as valuable as a human being. And how can the death of an innocent animal take the place of a guilty human being? Because it's, it's not a life for a life, not technically, because they're not equal value. I mean, answer this, how many, how many sheep would you kill before you would kill one human being? No, you got it. So the life of an animal could never take the place of the life of a human being. And yet it's a symbolic gesture that God instituted that the killing of an animal, the shedding of the blood was necessary because death was the result of sin. But instead of the individual who sinned dying, the death of an innocent animal took that person's place. But like I said, how could an animal take the place of a human being? No, a human being would have to take the place of another human being. But how would the death of one human being take the place of all human beings? <laughs> Couldn't happen unless that one human being had the value of all the humans who have ever lived, are living, or ever will live, or ever could live for that matter. This one person who has the value of all human beings would have to, well, how many people is God worth? Well, I guess a silly way to ask this is, how many people would you kill before you'd kill God? <laughs> you see, God, the Creator, is of infinite value in comparison to His creation. What would happen if God, by some miracle, could become a human being and still be God? How valuable would that one human being be? 
In that way, Jesus, the one person, by the one sacrifice, as a human, could take the place of humans because he has the value of all of us put together who have ever lived, are living, or ever will live, or ever could live. When Jesus died, it was a sacrifice that was, that was done once for all, never to be repeated, didn't have to be repeated because his death was enough. The cross is totally enough to forgive all of our sins. And when Jesus, the high priest, offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins, then he himself as the priest went into the holy of holies of God through, this is, this is what's wild, through his own body, which was the temple of God. Remember, he's the temple, he is the high priest, and he is the sacrifice to take away all sin. What's interesting about that is, that is the heart of the Jewish religion. The law was given to the Jews. The priesthood was given to the Jews, the temple, and the sacrificial system. If you don't have the law, the temple, the sacrifices, and the high priest, you don't have Judaism. But in Jesus, you have the fulfillment of all of Judaism. He is the embodiment of the law. He lived the law perfectly. He is the high priest. He is the very temple of the Holy Spirit, of God himself, the presence of God living in a body that would be the temple. And he is the ultimate sacrifice so that this priest, when he offered himself as a sacrifice and was raised from the dead, he sat down. His job was finished. See, the high priest was never finished. He went into the Holy of Holies once a year. And in the Holy of Holies, there was a box. Remember what that box was called? Right, the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant, do you remember what was in the box? The law, the stone tablets that contained the law, the Ten Commandments of God. And there was a pot of manna and a rod of Aaron that had bloomed, the pot of manna that never spoiled. And you remember the box called the Ark of the Covenant that contained the law. Now the law, did the people keep the law or did the people break the law? Well, the people broke the law. So above the box, on top of the box, there was what? A lid? No, there wasn't a lid. It was actually called a seat the mercy seat. And you had the cherubim, the, the angels, that the wings almost touched in the middle. This emblem of the mercy seat above the law, that can, above the box that contained the law of God that the people had broken. Once a year, the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctuary of the temple, and he took the blood of an animal and he sprinkled it on the mercy seat. Now watch, the blood went on the mercy seat, which covered the law. So the blood covered the law that they had broken and God forgave their sins. That's what the Bible says, he forgave their sins. Now some would say, well, God just rolled them forward until the cross. But you see, in the mind of God, Jesus had already died when he created the world. So as far as God was concerned, the death of Jesus had already really occurred because God is above time. But it, it took the physical death of Jesus on the cross to fulfill everything in the law, everything. First of all, he kept the law perfectly. Second of all, he himself is a sacrifice that shed, he shed his blood that would cover our sins that we had broken. And he took that blood and presented it to God as a life 
for our life. An exchange was made. His holiness for our sin. So that he would give to us his holiness. And he would make us a whole new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Check this out. This is still probably in your Bible. You might want to look at it, okay? 2 Corinthians. I'll, I'll get my Bible and you get yours. And I want you to open it up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 17. And here's what the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian Christians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a, watch it, a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. A little bit later in this page, the Apostle Paul says this, For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin. God made him who knew no sin to be sin. What happened? When Jesus was on the cross, God took all of the sins of all of the people who had ever lived, were living, or ever will live, and funneled them into the body of Jesus so that in him, all of our sins would be all. The penalty for our sin, death, separation from God, would take place. Remember what Jesus said on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You've got to understand that when Jesus died on the cross, it was more than just a physical death. When he prayed, God, please take this cup away from me. It was more than just, I don't want to die. I don't want to have the physical pain. There was a spiritual pain that Jesus suffered in taking our sin as if he were the one who did our sin. He died as if he were the murderer, the rapist, the stealer, the greedy person the liar, the deceiver. He died as if he were the one who had hurt others. He died as if he committed all of the sins. He paid for the penalty and he suffered for the guilt of our sin as well. To set us completely free and to make us brand new creation God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might become his righteousness. Become so right with God that God will treat us as if we're Jesus himself. Now that, my friend, is the miracle of new birth. That's what it means to be born again. That's what it means to, be, to gain a new life. You actually do get a new identity. And I know I've talked about this before, but this is like the core of the message of the gospel. God really does change you. Now, what did we say that Jesus was? The temple, right? The temple, the priest, and the sacrifice. What does he make us? He makes us a temple. He makes us priests, men and women, serving him as priests. Our bodies, our physical bodies, actually become the temple of God. He moves in to live inside of us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, we're told. We are a priest of God. And what do we offer up as sacrifice? our bodies as living sacrifices to him, praise as the sacrifice from our lips. That's we offer on a regular basis in our own temple, sacrifice to God 
our own bodies as living sacrifices to him. This is so exciting to me. And I want you to see the applications to this. Would you look again, open your Bibles. We were at 2 Corinthians. Turn backward two letters to the letter of Romans. And in Romans chapter 12, page 12 of this letter, here's what Paul said in verse 1. I beg you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That word worship, by the way, is the Greek word liturgy. Liturgy. What a priest does in the temple is liturgical rites. You, the priest, in your own body, the temple, present your bodies as living, living sacrifices. What do we do with the sacrifice? We kill it. What do we do with our bodies as living sacrifices? Well, we die to ourselves so that we can live to God. Romans chapter 6 still says, we died to sin we should not continue to live in it. So consider your bodies dead to sin, but alive to God. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Now here in chapter 12, he says, present your bodies as living sacrifices. Don't allow the world to mold you, conform. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is perfect and acceptable will of God and good. I'm here to tell you that your body, first of all, we're going to focus on this lesson on this first reality. You are the temple of God. Now, in the Greek, there are two words for temple that are translated in English, at least, as temple. The first word is hieron, hieron. That's talking about the large temple structure. And then in the temple, in the back smaller room of the temple, you remember what that, what that was called? The Holy of Holies, the sanctuary. And in that room, the Holy of Holies, there was a curtain that separated the rest of the temple from that part of the temple, the Holy of Holies. That very thick curtain. Remember when Jesus died, that, that veil, that curtain tore from the top to the bottom and separated, indicating that God was opening access to him through Jesus. Actually, his flesh had been torn. His flesh, Hebrews chapter 6 says, is the veil of the temple. Now, of the Holy of Holies. That's where the blood was taken in by the high priest once a year. He was the only one that could go into the Holy of Holies was the high priest. So Jesus, our high priest, went into the very sanctuary of God, the heavenly sanctuary with his own blood. And in doing so, he opened up the presence of the temple for all believers. That is this, you and I, when we come to Jesus, we become part of his body, right? We're the body of Christ. Well, Jesus said this about his own physical body. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Did he use the word hieron or the word naos, holy of holies, sanctuary? Which in their mind would also represent the whole temple, but he's really talking about the sanctuary there. Is he using the word naos or the word hieron? The whole temple or the holy of holies? Now, if you're guessing with me, I bet you guessed it right. Jesus used the word naos, holy of holies. Destroy this sanctuary, and in three days I will raise it up. When Jesus cleaned the temple. Remember he drove out the, the money changers and the animals that they were selling for, for terrible, ungodly profit. And Jesus drove them out. Well, he, he said, 
my father's house shall be a house of prayer. Did Jesus pray? Did Jesus pray often? See, he is father's house. And you and I have come to be a part of father's house. When we came into Jesus, he made us part of his body and his body is the temple. So we are called the temple of God. Now are we called the Hieron or are we called the Naos, the Holy of Holies? You're right. We are the Naos, the Holy of Holies. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says the whole church is the temple. This is verse 16. Did you know you are the temple of, the, of God? And whoever destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. There he's talking about unity. Whoever destroys the unity of the body of Christ, the temple, God will destroy that person. But more specifically, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says our bodies, physical bodies, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And in saying that, he said, don't you know that whenever you join yourself to a, even a prostitute sexually, you become one flesh with her. See, sex is designed for two people to become one. It's not just to have babies. It's not just for pleasure. Now, that's how we do have babies and sex relation is pleasurable. But it's not just for that. God's design for the sexual relationship is expressed in Genesis chapter three, or Genesis chapter two rather, when God brought Eve to Moses, or rather to Adam, he said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Then Moses commented, he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, join to his wife, the King James Version, the old English version says, cleave to his wife, and the two shall become, that's right, one. One plus one in the Bible equals one. <laughs> Husband and wife in a sexual relationship become one flesh. Paul said, this is a mystery we need to understand. Even a sexual relationship with a prostitute, you have become one flesh with her. The design of sex is for one flesh. Now, why am I saying that? Because Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is this, your bodies don't belong to you anymore. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have been bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now here's the question. This is the practical application of the first principle we're talking about here as you are the temple of God. Your body is the temple of God. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside you if you're a Christian. So ask this question every day for the rest of this month. In fact, all the way through the end of this year, I'm gonna ask you to every day, three times a day, I want you to at least three times a day ask this question. God, I am your temple. How does the temple of God behave when he or when she goes to work, when he or she interacts with husband or wife. How does the temple of God treat children? How does the temple of God, huh, young people, you're dating, you're spending time with each other. How does the temple of God act around others? How does the temple of God date? You see, if you belong to God and your body is his temple, then that means that others should not have privileges with your body. You need to tell your boyfriend 
or your girlfriend, hands off. Get your hands off God's temple, right? Because you're to be holy as the temple of God. How does God's temple behave? And the first application of that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 in the sexual realm. We're to be pure. Other people should not be seeing the full, <laughs> the full glory of the temple of God. That is, others should not see that God's temple without any clothes on, right? You see, you are pure. You've been made holy. You don't belong to you anymore. Your body belongs to God and He lives inside you. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, that place is holy ground. This body is made out of ground. It's made out of dirt. And the Holy Spirit of God lives in this body. This is holy ground. And I'm looking at you now through the lens of this camera. I'm watching you. I'm seeing in my mind's eye, I see you and I see your body. Your body is holy ground if indeed the Holy Spirit of God lives inside you. And He does if you belong to Christ. In fact, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, doesn't belong to Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. You belong to Jesus, so you have His Spirit living inside you. And the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. So, how does the Holy Spirit of God drive? How, that, that should help make every decision we make. If I know who I am, I know how to live. God has said, you are His temple. So for the rest of this month, November, and into December, would you think with me would you meditate on this? Would you go back and look through the Bible about how God designed the temple? Think about this. When Jesus came into the temple and he saw people selling animals and making an ungodly profit, cheating people, the poor, by selling them animals for a great profit, because they traveled from all over the world, all over the Mediterranean world to Jerusalem to offer up sacrifices to God, but they didn't have their own animals, so they brought money, they bought, they exchanged the money, the exchange rate, they, they were cheated, and then they sold the animals for a terrible profit. And Jesus saw this, and he took ropes, and he put them together, and he drove them out of the temple. What is there in your temple that Jesus wants to drive out, that He is driving out, that, that you're involved in that, that should not take place? Pornography? How many of you are watching pornography on the internet or in magazines or movies or reading them in books? How about ungodly television shows, or conversations, or language. Jesus wants to drive that out. How about greed? Many of us are consumed with greed, which really is idolatry, the Bible says. He wants to drive that out of His temple. How about gluttony, overeating? Eating so much, you know, you walk, you, you walk up to the table, you eat, and then you waddle out like a big, you know, <laughs> right? And he says, I want to get that out of your life because you're holy. You belong to me. Glorify God in your body. Look, this is the only body you have. Take care of it. He's let you live in your body that now belongs to him. You're the manager of somebody else's property. Your body belongs to God because you are His temple. And I hope this has been an encouraging message to you. 
I want you to think about how special you are because God has made you his temple. This isn't to be a restrictive message. This is a message of liberation. You are free from sexual sin. You are free from greed controlling your life. You are free from food controlling your life. You are free from any of the sins, that, the, the narcotics, the drugs, the alcohol that have been possessing and driving you, you're free from that because you don't have to live that way anymore. Jesus will help drive those out of your life, but you need to turn them over to the one who owns the temple. Meditate on these, on these things because you see, you are the house of God. Final application, and this is it. Jesus said, my father's house is a house of prayer. The temple of God was a place where God promised, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven, I will heal their land, and I will forgive their sins. Now, this is important. We look to the temple to pray, the Jewish people did. They would look toward the east where the temple was and pray, believing that God would hear them as they prayed toward the temple. Jesus said, my father's house is a house of prayer. We are father's house. So we are to be people of prayer. How much are you praying? Do you see the privilege of always praying to God? I mean, think about this. He lives inside you. Don't ignore him. He is the best friend you've ever had. He loves you more than you could ever love yourself and he loves you more than anyone has ever loved you. He's committed to you more than you're committed to you. He wants the best in your life and he wants you to live the fullest and I believe the happiest life. And the happiest life comes out of a life of commitment to Him and living in service to other people. When you serve others, you are the happiest. When you're committed to God and you have a right relationship with Him, you are the fullest. You are the happiest. He's always with you and He is your best friend. He is your Lord and He's the God of heaven. You can talk to him any time, all the time. Why not? Be the house of prayer. In fact, why don't you join with me now as we conclude this message and let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for living inside of us, claiming us as your own, making us your own through Jesus, your son, Thank you for your Holy Spirit who lives inside of us and who has made us to be your temple. Thank you for making us holy. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you for being involved in our lives and driving out of our bodies, out of our lives, the things that are not pure and are not holy and, that, and bringing into our lives more of what is pure and holy and dedicated to you. That's what we want. We want to be full of your love, of your mercy, of your forgiveness, of your presence, God. We want your power. We want to walk in this world as you have made us to be, your temple, priests, and sacrifices. Help us to live out those things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you for being a part of this study today.